everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Rochelle Rayner and we're going to be talking all about how you can create win-win situations in negotiations in the real estate space. Before we get into it with Rochelle, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's do this. Rochelle, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join us. I know you're very busy and I appreciate your time today. So before we jump in, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Thank you so much, Darren, for having me. It's a pleasure. So my name is Rochelle Rayner and I am based here in New York. Um, and I've been in real estate development and construction for my uh, whole um, adult life. So, you know, I started out, um, you know, like I said, in construction and then, you know, in the corporate world kind of moved up through uh, and, and represented the owner um, on two uh, very uh, well-known companies, world, worldwide companies. And then, um, you know, started investing on my own. You know, I just, I would think like, my God, how are these people doing this? You know, like, how are they where are they getting the money? Because we're talking like billions of dollars. We're not just talking like $100,000. We're talking like, you know, 11 and a half billion was one of the projects I was working on. So I'm like, where are they getting this money? And so, you know, I started out by just reading, you know, everything I could get my hands on and just, um, you know, all the, the documents that I could find in the company, you know, I would just read, you know, go into the hard drives and just, you know, take it home and, and just study it. Um, and then, you know, I started going to some real estate classes and found bigger pockets. I uh, started uh, partnering up with uh, local people in the area to do fix and flips and really just cut my teeth, you know, on um, getting the experience and, and just doing whatever my hand found to do. You know, I, I was not shy of work. Um, I worked for free a lot uh, for many years and, you know, really took the raw into the deal, but that was very strategic on my part. And, you know, at this point in my life, I'm, I can look back and I'm, I'm glad I started out that way. Is there a, something that you're finding that is being overlooked by a lot of other investors that you're finding opportunity in? So I think the first thing that, um, I do, usually do is I like to look at things that other people have passed over to see what was missed. Um, a lot of times people just, you know, use a certain metric on things, especially like on commercial properties, they'll use a metric and, you know, if it doesn't fit within their number space, then they're quickly to just, you know, pass the deal off. Um, but I like to look at, you know, where is the value in this? And so, you know, a lot of people will do that, but it's another thing to actually find the value, you know, and to find the, the little golden nugget that other people maybe, you know, don't see right off. Um, and so I think that, you know, with having, um, you know, an opportunity, it's, it's, it's first, you know, seeing things that other people don't see, um, and then, you know, kind of starting from there. And when you do find those opportunities, is it a situation where you're finding that you need to change the approach and that's why it hasn't been an opportunity for somebody else? Or is it something where you just, they haven't done enough of their homework and due diligence on the same opportunity? Yeah. So I think that, you know, we live in such a cookie cutter world where it's like, you know, people just want a certain number and they're not really willing to work for that number. So like, you know, you can look at, at something like, let's say you see a, a raw piece of land, you know, which is a blank slate, you know, and someone's like, oh, what would I do with that? I don't invest in raw land. Well, maybe, you know, there is, something like a development going up close by, you know, or there's money being pumped into the city, you know, near this area, maybe it's an opportunity zone, you know, maybe that seller is willing to, you know, hold a note on it for a certain amount of time and you put zero money down. So like, it's really just about you having a creative mind and seeing what other people don't see, you know? So I think that, um, you know, it's like, if you're just quickly running numbers on something and you're just mowing through, you know, the deals then, you know, and you're not just sitting down, taking time to just process it all and say, okay, like, can I add more to this, you know, so that I can bring my numbers up? Like, you know, if I do, and it's not just about doing a renovation of like, you know, putting lipstick on a pig, you know, it's about doing something to really be more creative, you know, and I just, I see a lot of people just kind of moving through it and, and not, not just finding those opportunities where they're not just in your face. Can you walk us through a recent transaction or one of your favorite deals where you were able to negotiate, you know, a win-win situation 
um, based on an opportunity that, that a lot of other people had passed up. So one of my most favorite transactions is actually the house that I live in. I never uh, thought that I would do a house hack because I never wanted to live in, you know, after living in an apartment for many years in New York City, um, I wanted to have a house and not have, you know, neighbors that close, um, and especially if I'm paying a mortgage. Uh, but I, I had sold a short-term rental that I had uh, last summer, and I had put it into a 1031 exchange. And remember, this is the time during the pandemic when the real estate market was really going crazy. Um, I had gotten a cash offer for that property more than double what I paid for it. And uh, so I took it, I put it in a 1031 exchange. And then was thinking, oh crap, what am I going to do with this money? Because I couldn't find anything, you know, that was comparable to what I was trying to exchange. And so I was like feeling a little stuck. And you have a time frame. So for those of you that are not familiar with uh, 1031, you have a certain amount of time where you have to choose a property, and then a certain amount of time where you have to close on that property. So, um, so I was kind of in that, you know, in between. And I'm, I'm, I was actually looking at the Zillow app on my phone. And I came across this house that was just, I was like, this is my house. And it was perfect on the lake, beautiful, um, you know, and it was a, it was listed as a, a three family. And I said, oh, this would be perfect if I can get this under contract. And I called my agent and we um, went to view it. Before we went to view it, he said, I'm going to warn you, there is an early accepted offer on the property. Um, and so I said, okay, well, let's tee up the offer before we go. And if it's what I think it is, then we'll just press send. And I said to him, I want to offer $20,000 more than asking price. Um, I was, I knew I wanted it. And I said, unless it's falling down, there's a lot of stuff that I could do with that place. So we went and saw it and we uh, put the offer in and they that evening they rejected the offer because I wanted to do something really creative, which was I wanted to close with an FHA loan on a three family using a 1031 exchange. I was told that I could do it um, by my CPA because half of the property would be rented out and the other half I would live in and that the IRS would accept this. And then the 1031 exchange said, yes, no problem. You can use FHA um, you know, uh, program with, and for those that don't know what FHA, it's first time homeowners, um, loan. And so you, you, you would get this, it's a, a very low down payment is what I was trying to do. And so the reason I was trying to do the low down payment was because the house needed some work that needed new windows. It needed, you know, a section of the roof needed to be redone. So I didn't want to put all of the money uh, that I had from the 1031 exchange into the equity. So I thought, let me keep some back and then be able to use it for repairs. So um, anyway, we the the process took forever because of COVID and things were just like you know slow and you know getting title and uh, and you know the appraisal and all that stuff. Um, also, the house was a was a it is actually a legal two family and it has a third apartment. So there was like that component to work with and there wasn't a whole lot of like houses of this size in the county and so they did me a favor and they actually um, gave me an appraisal from the next county over which is a very expensive county and I uh, so I got a decent appraisal and then um, right before right after everything went through um, the bank called me and said oh I'm sorry we're not going to be able to use your SHA or your 1031 exchange funds and I said, what do you mean? It's not 1031 exchange funds. It's 1031 exchange program that's holding the funds. And the bank had screwed up. They used the wrong terminology and the underwriter rejected it. So we went back and forth and, and eventually um, they, they told me, we're sorry, we can't, you know, we can't use it. And, and so I went through their document, it was like a thousand pages and we, I wrote up something and sent it in to them. And um, he was like, you have to pull out the money. So we ended up, uh, I was just about to send the message to the 1031 exchange company and I hit refresh. And he was like, wait, wait, um, the email came through. He was like, we, we got it. They're, they're going to let you use it. 
And so anyway, so we were able to close using that. So it was very cool. We used tax deferred money um, to purchase using only three and a half percent down. Um, and so that was just such a great win and, and, you know, and tax, you know, this, and we'll probably do it again if we ever sell this place. So we ended up only paying, um, we pay about uh, $800 a month in mortgage. Um, and we went from apartment living um, closer to the city, which we were paying like 2,800 a month um, to an $800 a month. And this house is like over 5,000 square feet. Like it's massive on the lake. So uh, very, very cool deal. It took a lot of work to put it together, but we had a really good team. Walk us through 1031 Exchange because I think it is a really interesting program that the US offers. And um, you're a Canadian as well, born and raised in, in Prince Edward Island. Um, yeah. And so you understand both the Canadian market and the US market. So to talk us through 1031 Exchange and how it works. So 1031 Exchange is actually an IRS term um, that allows you to defer the, the capital gains taxes um, on the sale of a property. So you can, uh, when you sell a property, you would use an intermediary that would um, basically like an escrow company that would hold the money um, during the period where you are um, selling it. So you're selling the property and then there's a 35 day, I think 45 day window where you have to select, make a list of properties that you wish to buy. You don't have to close on them, but you just have to send in a list. You have 30, 35 to 45 days. I'm not sure which one it is, but you have to send them it, send it in to the 1031 exchange company and then um, they will file that with the IRS. And then you have, I think it's 120 days to close or six months to close, some, some time frame like that. And, and then you close on whatever property is. You can also um, close on two properties. So as long as you just use all of the funds, um, otherwise, whatever you don't use, you're going to be taxed on. The funds from the sale, let's call it property A, um, they go into the 1031 exchange. They go to the 1031 exchange company. Is that Kind of how yeah. it's like separate than a title company then? So they're just, they just hold the funds like in a kind of like an escrow account. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time to close on the property, they just, they will wire the funds to um, the, the, the seller's uh, attorney or, or title company. And then on the, the, so on the, the property that you were purchasing, what was the issue? Why did they not want to, or why was it the FHA that they were concerned about? Or they were uh, concerned about the, the 1031 exchange. The lender that I was working with, he he said that so there's only certain acceptable uses of funds from like sources of funds. So mm. um, the sale of a property is where the funds were coming from, and so that was the right terminology to use was that she's using you know funds the sources from the you know sale of the property. But he said she's using 1031 exchange money and they didn't know what that meant. You know, they just looked in their document and they said, there's no such thing as 1031 here. You can't use it. They, so they didn't understand that it was just a holding company, like a, mm -hmm. an escrow and an IRS function that has really nothing to do with them. So when I show, could show them proof that we sold the property and that's where the money was coming from, then one bank finally said yes. And the FHA, um, you said it's the first time home buyers kind of plan. How were you able to capitalize on that? Because clearly this wasn't the first piece of real estate that you've bought. So the cool thing about that program is you can actually use it over and over and over again. Um, you, you can't have two at the same time, but you can definitely use them multiple times. So um, what a lot of people do is they'll buy their house tax that they live in with an FHA loan. And then in two years, they refinance out into a conventional loan, usually get a lower mortgage rate or they get lower payments or take a cash out refinance, depending on the, your situation. And then they go and buy another one all over again using the FHA. So that's a pretty cool program here in the US, but you have, you, you have to live in the property. So mm -hmm. if it's not, um, if it's not something you're going to live in, you won't be able to use it. I guess it's similar to our program here where it's basically your principal residence. The bank will accept up to maximum 95% loan to value on a, on a principal residence if yeah, you're, you're planning to live in it. And I know a lot of people yeah. use that as a way to, to house hack and do some other strategies like that. You mentioned three and a half percent. Is that, is that a typical down payment on a FHA loan? Yeah, three and a half percent. 
you buy this uh, multiple unit property with basically, like, as you mentioned, three and a half percent down and use the funds from your 1031 exchange, which means that they're not, you're not paying the tax on the last sale because those funds are being funneled into this new transaction. Um, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a brilliant strategy. I love it. I wish it was available here. We don't have anything similar to a 1031 exchange. We do have a principal residence um, you know, uh, restriction in terms of mortgages, but I, I think you're right. That's a, that's a great way to negotiate a deal that you end up getting the benefit of living in that property for a fraction of the price of living downtown. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great option for people that are looking to get started too. You know, they can just go in with a very small amount down, but I will mention that we were coming from, so I, so just to give you kind of quick numbers and why the, those two deals were just such a good deal was, I bought that house for $60,000, the, the original one, and I put about $12,000 worth of work into it. I short-term rented it for a year and a few months, and I made like $30,000 in that year and three months, um, and we sold it for $139,000. So we made a lot of money on that deal, and then we bought this house and we, we bought this house for 570,000. So we went from like a tiny little $60,000 property to a over half a million dollar asset, you know, and we've done some work since. So it's probably going to be worth, you know, a lot more, especially when we finish everything, I'd say we, it, it will probably be worth close to eight to 900,000. And you have additional revenue coming in from the other units in the property, or did you take over the whole house? No, so we have two. We have two tenants, and one of the units rents for twenty three fifty, and the other one rents for thirteen hundred. So that leaves us with, you know, well, we have very high taxes here too, so it's like eighteen thousand a year or something. So after all that, we only pay out of pocket eight hundred dollars a month is our portion of the mortgage. So it's pretty uh, a pretty decent, you know, deal at the end of the day. I mean, we won on that one. And I think this is something where. A lot of first-time investors, and I'd love to get your opinion on this too. A lot of first-time investors ask me, you know, what should I be buying? What should I be um, investing in as my first property? And I love this model that you just explained because it is very unique. And I always tell people like, get into a property that has multiple units, live in one as your principal residence. This is house hacking 101, right? But live in one as your principal residence to get low mortgage rates, but you've got the revenue of the other unit that's offsetting your living costs. Um, is this, is this a strategy that you, you know, sort of readily teach and, and explain to investors as a first, a good first time strategy, or do you think it's more suited to investors that have a little bit more experience? Definitely. If, if you're looking to get into your first property, it's a very good strategy. Um, I, I, as I mentioned at the first of this, I, I didn't think I would like it because, you know, I just didn't know if I wanted to live with my tenants. But I have really great tenants and I don't have to worry about it, you know, knock on wood, um, you know, especially with everything that's going on in this climate. But um, we are very lucky to have great tenants um, that keep their space clean, you know, they're quiet, they pay their rent on time. So, you know, it, you can be successful even in a really bad you know, time period that we're going through as a pandemic. So, you know, we, we were successful with it. And, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience in managing properties because that's just not my thing. Um, so, but I think that it, it went really well. Like, I wouldn't say that there's like a lot of like management. I mean, we keep on top of the maintenance and, and that kind of thing. So like, we're not, um, you know, running into emergencies. What is your best piece of advice for people that would want to use a similar strategy? I guess you could take the 1031 exchange out of it, but if you put those two elements together, it's a pretty powerful tool where you have tax exempt or tax deferred money coming in and uh, a low down payment, low interest and, and multiple revenue sources coming in from a property. Um, are, do you think these opportunities are readily available in other markets or is this a unique thing to, to your market that you're investing in? I think that this is a really good strategy because you don't have to necessarily focus on the numbers so much, especially if it's going to be your primary residence. You don't have to worry about cash flowing, right? So if you're currently renting or you have a high mortgage that you're trying to get out of or whatever your situation is, um, you can you know get into a house hack and like you said, um, have income coming in or having that subsidized, you know, your, your uh, housing cost. So it's, 
it's definitely great for beginners, um, highly recommended. And I think that, you know, anyone can do it in any market. I, I think there's opportunities everywhere, um, especially for those uh, investors who may be, um, you know, the, the investors who overlook some of these properties because maybe their numbers don't work, right? But if you're planning to live in it, you can make it work because you may be just willing to pay like $200 a month, $500 a month, whatever it is. So I will add this. So there's one other component to this house and um, the attic is literally humongous. It's 1500 square feet, full attic, um, completely unfinished. Uh, I am going, I bought all the materials. I'm gonna do an Airbnb, a luxury rental Airbnb. So um, that will be another stream of income out of this property that uh, you know will definitely be cash flowing at that point. So that was why I was willing to pay the twenty thousand dollar extra thing because I saw that opportunity in that attic and I said, oh, I can definitely make this space look amazing. And there's a hot tub out there that needs to be replaced. Like there's so much on this property that can really like sustain like hospitality and and you know so i'm getting my bang for my buck i really do appreciate your knowledge and your expertise uh, it's always great to have canadians who understand and invest in the u.s market because it, there are so many nuances that are different in the u.s market so i want to thank you for your time today uh, if you guys enjoyed the session with rochelle go ahead and do me a favor hit that like button below you can also subscribe to my channel hit that notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions for both rochelle and myself uh, you can also follow me on Facebook or Instagram or check out my website at darrenbros.com. With that, I'll say, Rochelle, thanks so much again for being here. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to join me. And hopefully at some point our borders will reopen and we can come and visit and uh, check out that hot tub you were talking about earlier. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Rochelle. Talk to you soon. Thanks.